Good morning, everybody. This is the Big Scoop podcast. It's Saturday morning. And you are listening to the tranquil sounds of Bungie just before we go diving. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Big Scoop podcast. With me is... Hello, Gemma's here. <laughs> it's six o'clock in the morning and the starts another big adventure. scuba adventure. And today we're going to be starting a... Uh, well, this podcast, will, this episode will be a sort of as we go during the day as we're diving at Stony Cove. Yeah, it'll be a roving report through the day. It certainly will be. Um, so we are using the Zoom recorder again. Um I hope I've got this on the right setting. We'll <laughs> find twiddling. out. We'll we'll fight now. Um, but yeah, all being well, it should work, and uh, we'll see how today's diving goes. Yeah, so about to head off on our drive to get there. Yeah, next stop, uh, uh, Stony Cove. But we might stop for a quick uh, grab a cup of tea and some fuel. Yeah, easy. Right, off we go. Well, it's uh, half past eight. Here we are. Uh, outside in in the queue yeah. at Stony Cove. Not We've seen it, it like this before. No, it's very busy. Uh, it's a beautiful morning. It's sunny. It's uh, bright. It's warm. Ten degrees. Too I'm starting to. Th- warm. <laughs> well, it's not too bad. Could be could be worse. Yeah, um, blue sky though. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, I'm starting to think I should have brought my semi dry suit. <laughs> Will I be too hot in my, in my dry suit? I don't think. There's no wind today, is there? It's like yeah. pretty still. Yeah. So it's good to see lots of people. I wonder who's going to be here. You see some familiar faces? Yeah, a bit of that. But the crows, there's lots of crows about. Have a listen. It's the Stony Cove crows. <laughs> <laughs> we take wildlife wherever yes. we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so we are back and uh, we're about to have our first dive. Yep, we've kitted up, well, up to our waists in our dry suits. Dry suit, about to have a plan on what we're going to do for our first dive. Um, And also, really busy here. It is, it's the busiest I've seen it in my time. Yeah, Calf Park is actually jammed. I think there's people in the overflow and the viz looks really good. Uh, Water temperature is about 10 degrees. It was 10 degrees up there and the visibility was 4 to 8 metres. Yep. Um, so by the time this go out, we should be home and probably at work. But um, you know, uh, it'd be good to hear from you if you're up this weekend uh, diving. Yeah, uh, if you've been diving, yep. that'd be really cool. Um, so, uh, quite a few people here with rebreathers. Today. There are, there are quite a lot of. But you're not the only female. I'm in, not. In the dive I was site. a bit worried at first, but yes, there are a few girls there around. There's a few actually. There's a few girls. Yeah, about. and we've got the open water swimmers in with their swim floats going Crazy. around the lake. Yeah, some in wetsuits and some not in wetsuits. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah. They look like they're having a lovely. It's a lovely and sunny morning, so perfect conditions. Yeah, and funny enough, um, uh, Stony has uh, gone back to how they were before the uh, lockdowns so yeah. you've got to reserve a car park space so if you are looking to book um, you might want to uh, bear that in mind if you want to guarantee a space when you come diving if, yeah. you know if not come here early and generally you'll get space anyway and spaces for the day are 10 pounds um, we didn't reserve a space but we were quite lucky today lucky. yeah we've we got decent yeah. space yeah. Yeah. if we've been any later then we probably would have been in the overflow mm. today but uh, yeah so that's a beautiful day. Right, let's go do, let's do the plan. Let's make a plan diving. and then yeah, we'll get kitted up and jump in. Okay. Hello, this is Gemma, Big Scuba Podcast. We have just finished diving, three dives at Stony Cove. Yeah, and um, it's been a really nice day, is not it? I feel Perfect. Oh, yeah, <laughs> what have you been doing, diving? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been really good. Uh, three dives done, um, so that brings you to... 49. 49, yeah, 49. Yeah. Um, stage on the shelf because we want to practice photography. Yeah, and buoyancy. New, new camera. Yeah, so it was great. It was uh, nice and relaxed, and just saw the cockpit and the Nautilus, and we saw the 
box room, blockhouse. Blockhouse, yeah. Yeah, and uh, plenty of fish. Were about, but yeah, some big perch about today. Anyway. Yeah, it was great to see some life in the. It's obviously warming up, so the temperature wasn't too bad, was it? No, was it? no. Uh, I recorded 12 degrees mm. temperature. Visibility was awesome. It was amazing to start with, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's say 10. Yeah, 10 meters. I'd say it was. It was amazing to start with. Yeah. Um, you could see. Yeah, that was really good visibility. I'm not sure what it's like on depth. Um, so I well, don't know about that. No. One. But yeah, sp yeah, on the shelf and what have you. I think that's the best I've ever seen it yeah. in all my well, short uh, time diving. I was on the just off the shelf, and I could see to the bottom, which is probably uh, looking down. It's probably about sixteen meters. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and we I were could, down. I could see that. I could see the bottom quite clearly. Mm. Uh, so that yeah, not bad at all. So mm. all the um, the haziness and the crud that was in the water from that uh, sand that come over a few weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, that's, that's all gone. gone. Yeah, so yeah. Which is really nice. Yeah, so it's yeah, really super dives. Yeah. Um, so hello to everyone who's been here. I hope you all had a really good uh, day diving. Uh, it's been nice. Yeah, it has. Yeah, nice yeah. and relaxed and nice to see it so busy as well. Lots of people here. Yeah. All sorts of divers. I had a bit of a problem with my regulator. Um, I, I think I need to get that looked at. So um, I had air coming out of the between the looks like somewhere in the actually inside it. Yeah. Something was leaking, so it could be the uh, diaphragm. But Perhaps. best to get it checked so, out. Like, yeah, I'll get it checked. I could do it myself, but I don't mm. really trust myself. I'd rather just get it checked. Yeah. Um, yeah. But apart from that, um, that was a really nice dive. Really yep. Three really nice dives. Yeah, we used the Olympus. Uh, TG6. That is a really nice camera yeah. and uh, really nice, easy to use housing as well. Yeah, really easy to handle in the water as well. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah so um, and it is good for 15 metres on its own, but with the case, and you can go deeper. Yeah, so we have the housing in and you use the paralens yeah, as well. Yeah, so yeah, so we'll see what that come out like. Yeah, so we've hopefully got some good footage today. Yeah, albeit well. Yeah, so that'd be really good. Yeah. Okay, well, that'll do for now, but uh, for. Um, Thanks for Stony Co for having us. Yeah, thanks for being buddy. <laughs> right, thanks, buddy. So we are back in the car. The diving is done. Gear packed away. And uh, we are nearly home. Mm. Nearly back. And uh, back into good old Norfolk. So we thought we'll just um, have a quick tea break. And yep, rest um, up. do a quick debrief of the day. Really? Yes, so how and was we've your day? we line up our guest as well. We've, yeah, we've got a guest We've also up. got a guest for you. Um, so what do you think of your diving today? I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah, and yeah, it was great that we got three dives in and practised buoyancy and used the new camera and housing. Yeah, well, so what do you think? Of the camera, it was yeah. great. Yeah, I was a bit so, worried about you know, having something else to attach to me and use, but it was really really good and i'm very happy with yeah how it worked yeah so we've got the um olympus tg6 that's the red version that we've got mm -hmm. uh, the little tough camera it certainly is yeah but we've obviously put it in a waterproof housing because we didn't know yeah so olympus do a um a pacific housing for that which is yeah. good for 40 meters yes yeah so just to be safe more, and more, more than enough for us <laughs> yes yeah yeah, so today it was just sort of practicing using it with the housing on, and yeah, yeah just sort we of haven't point. Got a light for it, yeah, have we? No, but I think we're getting to grips with pointing and shooting, and we took a couple of videos and yeah, yeah a few pictures of each other, and saw some fish. Yeah, saw some big pike, saw some perch, saw a big shot of roach as mm -hmm. well, um, and a few of the old um, doobie what's it? Crayfish. Crayfish. Yeah. Yeah. Saw a few of them. A few divers as well. <laughs> yes, there was a few divers in the water. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly tell you about the tough camera. If you're thinking about buying a tough camera, um, you certainly want to, you know, uh, consider this. Um, the tough camera is built for adrenaline junkies. Are you an adrenaline junkie? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who want to capture fast action and under extreme conditions. Uh, tough are uh, waterproof, shockproof, crashproof, freezerproof, and dustproof. So you can use them for all sorts of, of things. Yeah. Uh, 12 megapixels. Um, so it's got, you know, just about everything you need. And the other thing to point out, it's not just a diving camera. People use it, you know, in extreme 
conditions like on construction sites, yeah. all sorts. So it's yeah, a tank. It's a four and a half to eighteen millimeter uh, focal length, um, twenty-five to hundred mil uh, focal length on the lens. Mm -hmm. um, what else we got? You can get a LCD screen on the back. And I must say, that was really clear underwater. It was. A, yeah. yeah. And you get four times digital zoom on that as well. Um, and it is designed um, you know, for all these harsh conditions, mm. using it underwater and in bad light, because it's got some different settings on it. Yeah, like even the distance. underwater one, it's got uh, one with good light, one for a wide, a wide angle view. Yeah. So it's really good, and then there were obviously the macro and microscope options underwater. You uh, connected up wirelessly after you first yep, dived. There's an app. Photos. You can download an app, and you can literally connect your smartphone, Android or iPhone, to the camera and immediately view the pictures you took, yeah. which is really fab. Which is really cool because you can go from dive to dive boat to Facebook, Instagram, social and all media. The rest. Yeah. So it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, really good. Great yeah. technology. And, yeah, if you just want a point-and-shoot camera, perfect. And if you want something a bit more technical, you, there are different settings. You can set your own um, specific settings up for different... Yeah. Uh, yeah we sourced um, ours direct from, uh, direct from OEM uh, systems, didn't we? Yeah, in so London. In London. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were really, really helpful. Um, so, you know... Get, if you look for a camera, definitely think about getting one from, you know, from there and um, getting one of these little tough cameras because they, they, you know, look really good. Yeah, yep. So um, contact them and uh, see what their range is like. Yeah, definitely. And uh, like they also, you know, you can get the housings to go with it. So if you want to go deeper than the standard fifteen meters, which is what you can on the camera. Yeah. You know, you can. So look up OM Digital Solutions there. Yeah, top yep. banana. Highly recommended. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, you can tell. You can <laughs> we're tell parked. <laughs> we're parked up because you can hear the the local wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> Big scuba fans. Yeah. Uh, they could be. Um, I saw something really interesting on the news this week, actually. Um, What's that? So Project May, is, which is Project M A H I. Um, I would uh, recommend you look them up if you are into sea craft and things like that. They have done an autonomous solar powered boat that's going to cross the Atlantic. Wow. Which is really cool. How, you know, how cool is that? Uh, they've got a great website. Look up Project May, which is M, so Project M A H I dot com. Um, and well done to them because they've created this boat. That's going to cross the Atlantic. All on its own? No, not manned? That's not manned, no. Mm. But obviously they are you know, in charge of it and uh, they've got a team of people who are being watching it. Wonder uh, how goal, There is a, you know, a project, there is a, an actual aim to this thing. So the, the goal of the project was to design, build and cross the Atlantic Ocean with an autonomous unmanned surface vessel powered by sunlight. Mm. During the crossing, the May 1 will collect crucial atmospheric and ocean graphic data which is then transmitted to their website so you can go on the website and you can see all the details about you know uh the crossing need to look that one up and uh, put the details in the show notes so yeah, people can pretty cool yeah. so uh yeah there's lots of it's a good old web website lots on there to have a look at i wonder how long Especially it will take you're a marine biologist yeah and, uh, and how long it will take to cross yeah because so. four women rode it a couple of years ago and it took 67 days well here we go you asked the question, and I you got the, the answer. I'll give you the answer. So it's travelled eight thousand kilometres in six months. Wow, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Mm. And by solar. Yeah. Well, that just proves of technology, and you know what could come. You know. Whatever next. A bit further down the line. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I've like heard that. of boats with electric engines, sailboats. So. Yeah, you get a lot of boards. Cruises and things with electric mm. engines, don't you? Yeah. These days. But anyway, so that's that. 
Um, so we had a really good day. Uh, tiring, but glad to get home. Yeah, and we're now just about to enter the month of May, and that's looking like a nice busy one as that well. That is, that certainly <laughs> is. Um, so we get on to our guests. So we just tell you about our guest quickly. Yeah. So the guest coming up, um, it's a short one, but he is um, Jeff Lucas. He's not very tall. <laughs> no, I meant it's a short little oh. interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, so his name's Jeff Lucas. He's the author of The Lost Ship, which is a book. Um, it's a book that comes, it's a fictional book, but it comes from his experiences um, as being an amateur diver. And some of the book's proceeds are going to be donated to the Nature Conservancy. And they're all about conserving land and water throughout the whole world. Right, sounds so, good. Yeah, Let's do it. So, Yep, have a listen to our chat with Jeff Lucas. Hi, I'm Jeff Lucas, and I'm here with Gemma and Ian on the Big Scuba podcast. And we're going to discuss my upper middle grade novel called The Lost Ship. I was diving before you were born. <laughs> I love to say that. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Tell us all about it. Come on. What? Tell us all about it then, Jeff. How did you get started? Well, our family used to um, vacation in Hawaii. And of course, the locals did lots of spearfishing. And what they were doing was gaining their dinner. And so my dad would hire them to take me with them. And I then started it was originally it was skin diving and then this was back so far that they didn't even have the equipment to tie it to my back and so they had to fabricate a aluminum rack with a small bottle do they still call them bottles yeah yeah and we'll um this. and with of course sponge on it so it wouldn't cut into my shoulders and that was how i started and oh, wow. of course i I wasn't any good at spearfishing. They were, but uh, but I tagged along. Yeah. So how old were you about this sort of age? 12. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And of course, there weren't any certifications or anything then either. No, no. Yeah. So, so it's very just... much like learn as you learn as you go. Yeah. And, and I'd swam a lot. I'd swum a lot in my life. And so I, I was pretty comfortable in the water. Yeah. So. yeah. So how was your, when you first went underwater, breathing air underwater, how did it feel? Fabulous. So from that experience, where has your life taken you from the young 12 year old you? How's it progressed? Well, I grew up, <clears throat> excuse me, in a small agricultural community in the state of Washington uh, in the U.S. And there, there wasn't much diving there other than lake diving. And I played athletics and then I went to uh, Stanford and then I lived in Paris for a year and then went to Columbia for a, an MBA. And um, now here I am. So that's oh, wow. pretty much it. I, yeah. We had a family business. So I, I left Columbia, went back home and, and worked in the business for years. Yeah. What was you doing? What was the business? It was growing apples, pears, and cherries, also packing and shipping. Okay. Wow. Well, cool. That's yeah. good. Um, yeah. yeah. So we know you've written a book about uh, volleyball. So. Very good. So when did you think, oh, I'm going to write a book? <laughs> well, I, I, my, I was in a fraternity in California and there was a gentleman there who had played volleyball in the first Olympics that had volleyball. That's how far this goes back. And I was just, and, and I had actually never seen it played, you know, from my small community and, and fell in love with it. And so I played all my life and was also coaching. I coached high school for eight years and, and it seemed to me that there was a need. All right. And so, and I, I, you know, I mentioned being in business, but I have much more of a, I guess you'd say artistic or creative sensibility than a businessman. Right. <laughs> I never really got a kick out of the business. I did it, but uh, yeah. never enjoyed it. So. 
Yeah. So then obviously we'll talk about, you've written a book called The Lost Ship. Yes. So how did that come out of, it, it's not really linked to volleyball and. No, no, no but it's, it's quite linked to the spearfishing in Hawaii mm-hmm. yeah. because not unusually the, the locals would spear an octopus. And so then later in life, and I have photos of me, I wish I could show you one, but at age 12, standing there after a dive with an octopus on my chest. And then I found out later in life how smart they were. And the idea, I don't, I don't want to say it was entirely redemption, but the idea what, you know, sort of emanated from that. Yeah. And so, um, and, it, and it, was, it was actually really the most fun project I've ever done in my life. It was a blast. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose if you say you're creative, then that is kind of a real outlet to sort of get that going. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, it was, I started it in 1986 and of course started with the research. And I think I wrote like 10 pages because I'd never written that kind of stuff before. And it was so much fun. Then I had to set it aside for a while. I'd done most of the research when I went back to it, but then I had to put it together and make a linear story. And that took me four years because I wanted to get in everything I could that was interesting about the underwater. And of course, there's a lot of that. I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff. And so, and I did, I, I, once I had the outline, four years to get the outline, once I had that, then it was absolutely just a delight. Just, I laughed my my rear end off the whole way through. Yeah. So how did you do your research? Did you just read books or watch? Talk well, to kind of everything. No, there wasn't much watching. There was, um, it was mostly books and dive magazines because I wanted real stuff. And of course, in yeah. the dive magazines, the divers are describing experiences that they've actually had. And so, for example, in the book, the kid, the 12 year old kid, whose name is Jack, um, ends up cutting, cutting off ropes that were fraying into a manta ray and, and uh, abrading its skin, I mean, actually cutting into its skin. Also, it had six jugs that originally were floats, but were full of water now that were beating on its belly. And that was, I pulled that right out of a dive magazine because a guy had actually done that. And so... Yeah. There, there's the kid doing it so yeah yeah well there's so much people's experiences are just amazing around the world so there's yeah. just so Not much out there they're awesome you know amazing things to see in the in the wildlife yeah yeah so can you kind of tell us a bit about the adventures of jack and the octopus just to try and tempt people to try and yeah, oh yeah of- i learned the term elevator pitch so that's what you want right <laughs> my elevator pitch <laughs> Um, yeah, the kid's father is a professional diver working on a way to talk underwater. He loses one of the devices overboard and the octopus slips away with it and learns how to talk. And so then the kid goes out to shoot a photo of the octopus for a class project. And of course he, he can't believe it, but the octopus talks to him and he finally buys in. And then they head the, when the octopus came down out of the plankton, he'd seen this uh, wooden structure with three tall poles and um, some metal tubes sticking out of the side. And Jack decides that that could be the greatest maritime discovery in history. And so he felt Arm, Armstrong fell into a cavern that was fed by a uh, freshwater spring so that the shipworms weren't able to eat the wood right so then they head across the reef to see if they can find this greatest maritime discovery in history and they run into all kinds of sharks and experience an underwater earthquake and then they navigate an underwater cave system and then the four treasure hunters who are the bad guys show up and they want to plunder the plunder the ship and so they then they have to fight them off and now you now you know the whole story. Wow! <laughs> so that just came to you in a flash, did it? About kind of the framework of the book that how you wanted it to fit together. Well, the the main framework. I mean, 
one of the problems was that, of course, the the climax is when they're trapped in the ship. I mean, first of all, you have to have a ship that you can actually dive into. And as you know, when you find a treasure ship, all you find is sand and anchors and and guns and plates and maybe some leather, et cetera, because all the wood has been eaten. I mean, so that was kind of a problem. And then, of course, the treasure hunters, what needed to happen was that the two our two protagonists get caught in the ship, trapped. And so I had to, you know, I read, uh, examined a lot of old sailing ships. I mean, one of the one I used the most was Francis Drake's, I forget the name of it now, the Golden Hind, I think it was. Yeah. And um, and so I ended up create, creating a trapdoor in this ship so that they could slip out either through the trapdoor or straight out, depending on where when the bad guy showed up. And then of course the bad guy uh, slides a tre- a chest, one of the sailors' chests over the trapdoor, so they're trapped. And so so I'm not going to tell you how they get out of it. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was no. the book. No, it was fun. I'm not kidding. It was a blast. Yeah. It was really fun. Yeah. yeah. I laughed. I mean, I'd laugh in the shower, laugh in bed, thinking about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must have a yeah, an amazing imagination. So, but obviously doing all your research for the book, looking at marine environments. Right. How has that made you feel about the world's oceans and our underwater world? Well, you know, what I like is that I, I hired a publicist and he used the word mission. And that was one of the reasons that he took me on was he said he liked the mission. And of course, the mission is to save the oceans. I mean, and actually one of the, you probably know about the, the big boat that has the wings that are um, sails into the plastic to try to take up the plastic. Well, you know, I mean, that's one good thing that's going on, but of yeah. course there's a lot of bad things. Now, I didn't, I never liked stories as a kid that had morals. I mean, they were never, they were, they were kind of obvious and they were kind of shoved into the, into the story. And so there are no morals other than the fact that Armstrong says to Jack at one point that it's going to be you and your people who save the oceans. And so that was, uh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, well, certainly topical, you know, for everything that's going on at the moment and in, a, in an, an increasing manner as well. Well, and the stuff, I think it's pretty clear to people, you know, I, I use all the, the words that are, you know, associated with the, with the, the creatures in the ocean and, and I, I, and, and describe what they do, et cetera. And so I think that anybody who reads it will understand that it's the real stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anybody reading the book, is it directed at all ages and all backgrounds? Well, you know, it's re it's, it's oriented to fourth, fifth, sixth graders. But what I, and I, I consider it to be an imposition to ask adults to read it, but I'm not shy at all about saying, if you read it to your kid, you will have fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good, isn't it? You know, yeah. Yeah. Just people to read. But I had one, one gentleman, in fact, he was a, a very prominent architect that lived across the street from us. And he said, well, he said, you know, the thing I liked about it was he said, I could, I could just pick it back up and know I was going to get another fish. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, that sounds really good. And yeah, it sounds like anybody reading it is going to have a real experience of the underwater world. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's really, honestly, I, the only thing I didn't get in was the Greenland shark. And I can't even remember, is it the largest vertebrae? The Where oldest they? Greenland oldest, shark. Yeah, they, yeah. Years, don't they? yeah, they lived to 400 years. years old. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't get that in, but everything else I got in. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, every once in a while. Oh, and the other thing is, have you seen lately the puffer fish, what they do with the sand? They make, they make circles and kind of uh, artistic circles in the sand. Oh, I've seen something about this. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I might've gotten that in if I, if it had happened, you know, if they discovered that before I wrote it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sounds like you're lining yourself up for another book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think the next one's going to have to be in the jungle because I've exhausted the underwater. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always undiscovered. Yeah, there's a lot of ocean undiscovered. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Have you? Have, well, I guess I could ask you, but you know, one of the things that I wrote about was I I read three or four people that had been underwater when there was an earthquake, mm. and they described what it was like, and so I got to use that. I mean, that was, you know, another experience for them. So what did they say? Well, it was mostly just, you know, it was rat-a-tat-tat and it was screeches and like a locomotive stopping. And, you know, it was mostly sounds. Yeah. And then of course, I, I it, the, there was liquefaction. Is that the right word? Liquef liquefying of certain sections of the of the of the bottom, um, where the whole thing would yeah. just slide sideways. I mean, I think that happens on on uh, terra firma too. Yeah, but yeah. That was that was one of the other things that that I read about. Yeah, it must be pretty terrifying to see and witness, and uh, you know, pretty loud as well. I can imagine. Oh, I think I think that's right. I mean, yeah. although probably. You know, if you're suspended in the water, you're probably safe. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's but, true. Yeah. I think we've spoken to a previous guest, Chris Mears, in the Philippines. Mm. He mentioned that he experienced he an earthquake. Yeah. Yeah, oh. underwater. yeah. Yeah. So, but it's probably a, quite a rare, well, I don't know. It might be a rare occurrence, but. Well, you know, I read several things about it. But of course, if you think of all the people that are diving and all the earthquakes that are happening, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's rare, happening. but when you're reading it, when you got a dive magazine, you know, it's something to dive, to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So do you actively like read scuba diving magazines now? I don't, Gemma. I don't. Uh, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, every, every day is different, isn't it? It's just yeah. uh, everybody. Especially with social media. Do you follow anything on social media? You know, the social media thing, I've so much I've read about it, it, it seems to be kind of negative. I mean, right. a lot of bad yeah. things go on in regard to social media. And, you know, for example, I guess I, I'd really like to get my news from people that are professionals and and have research teams, et, et cetera. And so, no, I don't I don't do social media. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. So um, in terms of the book, is it out there as a hard copy are you selling it on amazon yes it's in bookstores it's kind of everywhere in fact i'm in the process in fact i just spent like about an hour last night listening to people um samples of people reading from for audiobooks i'm in the process of of building an audiobook too wow that's really good so, yeah. yeah 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 well it widens the audience as well because some people you know, if they don't want to pick up a hard copy, they can just put right. it on their head. Well, and if they've got the kid in the back seat and they're going to drive for 30 minutes, there's a distraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and more than one person can hear it as well, rather than one person read a, a hard Very copy. Very good, Gemma. You're yeah. right on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the back cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> let us know when the audio books out and uh, yeah, we'll give that a plug as well. So, you know. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it sounds like, um, yeah, a really interesting book and sounds like people can learn a lot from it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, the cover is really cool too. Have you seen the cover? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah with the yeah. octopus on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah good. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. worked out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody that's an octopus fan or yeah, is kind of mesmerized by them, it sounds like an ideal book. I just love it how they change color. I think that's brilliant. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, you know, and I, I, I just was invited to a school district to I made a presentation with PowerPoint to um, 10 schools in three days, which was exhausting. But okay. of course, I told uh, real stories, one of which was about it was it was in a coffee table book. And the gentleman was a, a photographer, uh, a marine photographer. And so he found the octopus and he very carefully pulled the rocks away 
And of course, the octopus went nuts and changed all different kinds of stories, uh, colors, and threw sand at him. And so he thought, OK, well, I'm not going to shake you up. And so he replaced all the rocks. Well, that was all it took. After that, they were buddies. The octopus came out and followed him around throughout the rest of his dive. Well, that kind of stuff I love. I mean, yeah. I, I, I wasn't able to get that in the book, but you know that, that shows that there's a sensibility there that we don't understand yet. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah very deep things, octopus. Yeah. yeah, and then of course there was the story about the the in the aquarium, the full size aquarium that, that for the public, and the gentleman would show up with a brush and prickle the octopus, and of course the octopus didn't like it, and so whenever he showed up, not didn't happen when other people showed up, but you could recognize the guy, he squirted water at him. <laughs> 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 yeah they're very intelligent uh, creatures yeah, yeah definitely yes, yeah exactly. there's a lot to learn yeah. yeah no well it's really 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 good to hear about the book so with all of our guests we ask uh, three set questions yeah. um just to find out what their take on things is so okay. one of the first I get really nervous no, not no, no, no. no. So based <laughs> on your book and everything that you've learned about the underwater world, if you could uh -huh. take three people, they can be past, present, they don't have to dive, but if you could take them into the underwater world, who would you take and why? Uh, yeah, I should have gotten nervous. Well, it wouldn't be Jacques Cousteau because, of course, he was grumpy. But uh, let me see, who would I take on the underwater world? It would probably be um, a, um, a fisherman. Let's say the old man in the sea mm -hmm. from Hemingway's book. How's that? Yeah. Good yeah. One. So that he would understand that we need to conserve, yeah. mm. et cetera. And it would probably be um a, a a world leader so maybe at this point it would be joe biden or i don't want to mention the other guy okay um so that's two how's that how am yeah. i doing yeah yep. Okay. Yep. one more to okay. go well, you know i can throw in jesus can't i i mean yeah, yeah. yeah maybe he'd do something yeah. we we have had jesus before and yeah. uh, i'm sure you have. we can yeah. have him again that's all yeah. good okay fine yeah yeah yep. okay no. Good choices. Good choices. Okay. We like okay, to. I'm really our, getting nervous. Go ahead. We like to give our listener a bit of a nugget as well to uh, take away from every episode, and um, you know, if and it doesn't have to be about diving, more of a uh, a manta for life type thing, I guess. Uh, but if it can be about diving, that'd be a bonus. Uh -huh. um, what would be your nugget for our listener who's listening? What What would you say there? is a good nugget for some the whole deer in life well you know once again i'd probably go back to the to the ocean thing because we're up here and everything else is down there yeah and so one of the things that allow that that the book allows one to do is to go down there and appreciate all the richness in the ocean Okay. And so that would probably be, I don't know if that constitutes a nugget or not, but that would mm. be, you know, I, I think about when you're, even when you're on a cruise or something, yeah. you're on the top and you don't get to see any of that. I mean, unless you're a diver, you don't get to appreciate any of it. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's, it's very alien. Yeah. So, yeah. It definitely. Yeah. There's another world that people really need to know about to obviously yeah. take an interest. Absolutely. In. And another world, I mean, is, is exactly right. Wasn't mm -hmm. that the name of the, what was the name of Jacques Cousteau's book? Something like the, the something about the world. I know that. Yeah. Uh, the blue world or something. Uh, okay. You raised a good point. One, I think, um, you raised a good point that people on cruise ships, actually, when they go to some of these fantastic places in the world, they actually miss quite a lot because they're not seeing, well, unless they, they, they are divers and they pay, they pay for uh, a dive a guided trip around somewhere where the where the boat stopped but mm -hmm. actually do miss quite a lot of the mm. place of where they're moored up don't they right when you think about exactly. it exactly yeah. yeah yeah so our third question is if you had a billboard that you could put out there for the whole world to see uh -huh. it, 
what would you put on it? It could be a statement, a picture, a video, but what would you put on that billboard to get something across to the world that is meaningful to you or a message? Well, you know, I'd probably go back to, you know, since I love the cover of the book so much, I'd probably go back to that. And, you know, what I'd like to, to do, of course, would be to induce people to uh, experience even vicariously the underwater in the hope of, of saving the oceans, which of course yeah. we know are in peril for several reasons. So that would probably be what I would do now. And that's sort of uh, shamelessly self-promoting, isn't it? <laughs> well, no, no, I think oh, it's a message. message across. Yeah. <laughs> all about the message really yeah, yeah thank yeah. you yeah yeah and you'll obviously the book cover is pretty powerful by yeah. you know seeing the uh, eye of the octopus and yeah the underwater. Yeah, I had, i've had i had publicists tell me that they you know really often wanted to change a cover but not this one so yeah no. oh no, that's it's good great it's good yeah no great I'm answers yeah yeah so if people want to find out more about you or go and buy the book where should they go? Well, the, my website is jefflucasauthor.com. And if they only Google Jeff Lucas, they'll get another Jeff Lucas who writes about religion. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that ain't me. <laughs> okay. That's not me. Fair so enough. that's in, you know, they can order it that way. And yeah. of course, it's in bookstores too. So And Amazon. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. And are we right in saying that a certain portion of the the money people pay goes to the Nature Conservancy? Conservancy? Yes. Yeah. yes. Are you familiar yeah. with that um, organization? <laughs> not not very much. So if... I, I think it's the largest environmental organization in the world. And I was introduced to it like 30 or 35 years ago and started contributing because what they do, they don't do anything through legislation or politics or yelling. They just buy habitat. Right. So, and, and preserve the habitat, which I just thought was such a wonderful idea. Yeah. So, mm. yeah. 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 Well, we'll uh, put notes in the show notes or links so that people then can click on those and then go and find out a bit more about you, your book, and where to buy it and also the the nature conservancy as well so yeah, you, right. thank you yeah get full coverage but <laughs> yeah, yeah go out and buy that book <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah no it's great it's been really good to have you on the podcast and yeah hear about the book and yeah what kind of experience it's going to give the reader as well or the yeah. listener well thank you well i've had fun it's righty uh well we hope you enjoyed that um it's yeah. always a bit of a short and sweet one um if it sounds a bit different this week it's because we're not on our usual setup we're in the car because we just finished diving and there's a little bit of a roving reporter using our zoom yeah we'll mix things up a little bit zoom so. recorder so if it sounds a bit different that's why bear with, bear with and we're back to the usual recording studios next week yep so there'll be a podcast out next monday as normal yeah certainly will um can you that'd be really good if you're listening if you can leave us a review it really helps us get found on itunes particularly yeah um so if you could do it don't cost anything you know it's f absolutely free uh we also always want to say thank you very much for everyone who downloads and listen to us waffle on yeah um if we had a really good chat with alex hildred <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we spoke to alex uh, alexa alex alexandra alexandra or uh, alex as she's called she goes by Hildred, <laughs> you'll get that right. It's been a long day, bear yeah. with And <laughs> from uh, the Mary, from Mary Rose, Rose Project. <laughs> and we had a really good chat with her and that, you know, really looking forward to sharing that with you in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and for all of you who remember the raising of the Mary Rose, it was 40 years ago, it'll be 40 years ago in October. Yeah, and they've got a big do coming up. So uh, keep an eye on their website about their big do. Yeah. So lots of celebrations. Yeah, 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 and rightly so. Yeah. Um, if you don't listen to us on iTunes, then maybe give us a review on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. If you've been diving this week, let us know. That'd be good. Let us know where you've been diving. Where you're at Stony. Yeah. And if you were, why didn't you say come and say hello? <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah send us a message and we'll give you a shout out on the next episode yeah hello to all the stony crew lot as well so i know some of them do listen yes yeah so, no, uh, it's uh, good to see everybody today and really good to see a busy dive site right time to go home that's it let's hit the road hit the road jack and it can come back no more <laughs> That's it. See you next week. Thanks for downloading. See you next week. Bye.